Good afternoon. It's 420, Wednesday, August 28th. This is the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Joe Bianca, Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And good afternoon. I'm Bill Finley. I've been covering racing so long, I think I actually wrote about Aristides Kentucky Derby in 1875. And I also do a horse racing radio show on Sirius XM called Down the Stretch every Saturday morning from 10 to 1 on channel 156. Shameless plug. Please tune us in. It's a darn good show. No shame at all. This is uh, Alan Carrasso. How are you doing, everybody? I'm the managing editor of the TDN. I have a face made for radio, so just be glad this is uh, audio only. All right. I think we should start with the, the biggest race of the past weekend, the Run Happy Travers, 150th edition of the Travers. Code of Honor kind of peaked at the right time, I would say. Bill, I know you had some thoughts about Suge's development of Code of Honor what do you think? Yeah, Joe, I mean, obviously the horse deserves credit, but if there was ever to me a day where the real star was the trainer, it was Shug McGahee. Th- this is a horse that we knew had talent all along, but he just wasn't coming through. He was like that guy in AAA who, you know, you knew he had all the tools, but every time you called him up to the major leagues, he'd hit 175 and he'd have to send him back down to the minors. McGahee obviously realized that he had to fix something. He had to get this horse's head right. He had to get him to mature. And he made every right move. He pushed every right button. He passed on the Preakness and the Belmont. Two races he may very well have won. He passed on the Jim Dandy and the Haskell. Again, two races he very well may have won. But remember, this is one of the sharpest and shrewdest trainers that's ever lived. And he zeroed in on one race and one race only, the Travers. And he put everything he had behind getting that horse right for the Travers. And boy, did he ever. Here was a horse again, that same AAA player who was the number one draft pick coming out of, you know, Vanderbilt or sort of a baseball school, for those of you who think I'm coming up with a crappy college football team, and and finally showed what he did. He went from being a pitcher with a 4.50 ERA to a guy who pitched a uh, nine-inning, two-hitter, complete game, and it was an absolutely awesome performance. But I, I don't think many trainers would have been able to get that out of him, and You know, this is why he's so good. This is why he's in the Hall of Fame. And it also served us as a reminder is Chad Brown's not the only trainer in the universe. There's some other guys out there that know what they're doing, too. Yeah, I mean, and even in the Travers, Chad Brown has been kind of an afterthought, I think, a lot of times. You know, he comes with a couple of contenders, but he hasn't won it yet. He's He was skipping races. He was supposed to run in the Holy Bowl in February, and passed on that race because he didn't like a breeze that the horse had instead pointed him to the fountain of youth and he scored there so he's been he's definitely picked his spots with the horse it was a good decision to take him back to the mile and the dwyer and he rewarded him there and he had he clearly had a plan from the derby to the trappers and he executed it perfectly interesting thing about him too is went wire to wire on his debut last year at saratoga and then develops into a deep closer to win the travers i feel like you don't see that many horses who show that kind of diversity from two to three. What an anecdote about Chad Brown, since you mentioned him. Um, in Thursday's edition of the, the TDN, I have a long Q&A with him. A lot of inf- information in there. And I asked him the one race he's never won that he wants to win more than any other. And 99.9% of all trainers, the answer, the Kentucky Derby, his answer, the Travers. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, they mentioned it a lot in the Saratoga Live broadcast that he really – he points to that race every year. It just, for whatever reason, it hasn't happened yet. Al, your thoughts about Code of Honor and the Travers? Yeah, you know, I think there's something to be said for uh, good old-fashioned horsemanship. And it's interesting that uh, Suge sort of turned the tables on on Bill Mott in the Travers after uh, fate sort of played its hand in the in the Derby and and uh, and Mott uh, got the better of Code of Honor all the with the DQ, but. Yeah, I, you know, I agree. Um, I think horse management is a um, sort of a, a lost art and lost art form. You know, too many times it's one step to the next and you just follow the program and, and you don't think outside the box. Like you said, Bill, um, to, to take a pass on the Preakness and to take a pass on the Bell and bring him back, cut him back to the mile for the wire. And then, you know, what's next? I mean, you know, big money guys or, the, or the conventional thinking is let's do – Jim Dandy, let's do the Haskell or something. The Haskell being where it was this year was probably not an option, but some might call it conservative, um, but, you know, 
Turns out it was a very, very smart thing. He sat the right trip, got a great ride from Johnny V, who uh, you know had him away from the dreaded inside on, on Saturday within uh, the first 100 yards. You know, had the horse where he needed to be. And, uh, you know, when he called upon him at the three ace, the response was, was instant, and uh, and he got the job done. Kind of wanted to lead that, lead from that into the larger, larger discussion about the three-year-old championship hunt. And maximum security, I would say, has a slight edge right now. He's the only one, I believe, with multiple grade one wins. Um, I think a lot of voters also consider him the winner of the Derby, even though he got DQ'd. I think a lot of people will vote that way. But he passed on a lot of big races, and he's allowed some other horses to kind of come up on his heels a little bit. He passed on the Travers. He's supposedly going to the Pennsylvania Derby, but it might be a similar thing to World of Trouble, other service horse star in the service barn where he was supposed to run the Troy Stakes, had a minor foot issue, had to pass on that, was pointing to the turf monster. Now he's got to pass on that. We don't know if we're going to see him the rest of the year. And so Maximum Security is, as of now, slated to run the Pennsylvania Derby, but I think he's had enough stops and starts that, that nothing's guaranteed. I, you know, I agree with you that nothing's guaranteed, but I disagree with you. that when, I think you use the term slight edge in the three-year-old championship. I don't think he has a slight edge. I think he's a clear leader right now for a couple reasons that, that you mentioned. First of all, he's the only horse to win two grade ones, which is amazing to think that we've gotten to the Travers. There's only two horses out there that have won two grade one races. And how are voters going to react to the Kentucky Derby? I mean, do you treat it as, what, where was he placed, 17th or what? Whatever. Do you treat it as a 17th place finish it or do you give him some credit for winning the Derby? I think you do have to give him some credit for at least crossing the finish line first in the Kentucky Derby. Now, right now, Code of Honor is the horse of the moment. He's the flavor of the month. But I think we're, we're forgetting about what maximum security has done. Coincidentally, as we speak today, Wednesday, he did have a workout, his first in three weeks. Typical Jason service, he worked four furlongs in three days and four seconds. <laughs> Actually, it was four, four furlongs in 53 and two fifths. Every single time this horse works, it is the slowest workout among the others. We should do an entire podcast someday on what Jason service is doing with his workouts. Um, he then put out a press release saying he was happy with the horse and he's going on to the Pennsylvania Derby. Now, now, if he wins the Pennsylvania Derby, I think he probably clinches the three-year-old championship, no matter what happens in the Breeders' Cup, because Code of Honor or any other three-year-old has a lot of catching up to do to, to pass this horse. And even if he doesn't win another race this year, I think they still have some catching up to do to pass him. Yeah, I think at minimum, another horse is going to have to have a second grade one win to be in the conversation. With and, and, and perhaps even win the Breeders' Cup Classic as well. Yeah. And that's what I was going to mention is that there are so few big races left, you know, on a national scale. In ter- I would think the Jockey Club Gold Cup, if somebody wants to take on Elders, and then, of course, the Breeders' Cup Classic. Pennsylvania Derby recently upgraded to grade one. So it's going to be interesting to see who shows up against maximum security there. But yeah, there are limited opportunities. And I agree that he does have a decent edge. I just think him passing on the Preakness and the Belmont and the Travers, I think he's left the door open for other horses. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would, I would agree with what you said. I, I agree with you, Bill. I think Maxim Security is the clear leader in, in the clubhouse. Looking at it from three weeks out, the Pennsylvania Derby certainly does not appear like it's going to be a walkover for him or any other horse. If uh, Improbable came back the other day. He's supposed to come cross country for that. A War of Will is supposed to show up in there uh, as well. The winner will certainly have to earn it, and that will, I think, that will go a long way towards defining who the champion is. And I do want to add one more thing, and, and Joe, that I agree with you. I, I think with the way Jason Service has trained this horse. And he's been very cryptic. He doesn't even speak to the press anymore. He just puts out press releases. Um, so you can't even have, he's cut off access to the media. You have to go through Monmouth Park publicity to find out anything about him, which is actually kind of annoying, but whatever. That's, the, you know, uh, I'm not going to hold that against Jason's service. Um, it just would make everybody's life easier if you can mm-hmm. talk to him. But you might be right. Who knows if he even shows up in the Pennsylvania Derby? I mean, everything was fine, fine, fine for the Travers. And then 40 hours before the race, oh, by the way, everything's not fine. We're not running. So that is another point to consider. If we see him in the entries, that's step one. But we got to see him in the starting gate, too. And and I'm a little bit skeptical that yeah. they don't make that race. Absolutely. Yeah. And like you said, he's, he's very cryptic. So you really never know until exactly. race day if you're going to see him or not. So I think that fact alone makes it a little bit up in the air for the rest of the year. I'm going to shift gears to a little bit of the undercard action. 
on Saturday's Travers Day card. And I think the race everybody was talking about afterwards was the personal ends in and what a battle it was between Midnight Bizu and Elate hooking up basically at the top of the stretch for the entire stretch. Really couldn't separate him at the line. Midnight Bizu just got a sliver of a nose down first. She, to me, has wrapped up the Older Mare Championship at the Eclipse Awards. But there is a wrinkle. Monomoy Girl, Bill, as you've reported, has started coming back on the work tab, and she's expected to race within the next, I guess, month or so. She, I don't think, will be a fly in the ointment to the championship hunt, but it'll be interesting to see if she can get back to where she was before and issue a challenge to Midnight Bisu because she had her number last year. Yeah, I mean, how fascinating this. And first of all, let, let's back up. You, you're right. Personal instance is one of the best horse races I've seen in a long time. I mean, you're not going to overshadow their unhappy Travers because it is the Travers, you know, and so it could have been a, a dull race with somebody winning by five lengths and nothing happening. It's still going to be what's going to steal all the attention. But clearly the best race of the day was the personal ensign. It's one of the better races I've ever seen. And we don't see enough of that in horse racing. Two really, really good horses in a late and midnight Bisu hooking up eyeballing one another and ding-donging it right to the wire. And then at, at the finish line, you know, Larry Comas is, you know, whatever, uh, uh, you know, hyperbole he used, you know, and, and you can't separate him and then the wire. I, I, I called him Mint Bisu, by the way, but it was, it was very, very close. I, I wish every horse race, especially at the grade one level, was like that. But now the very interesting thing about that is, okay, you're right. Game, set, match. Midnight Bisu is the older Philly and Mayor champion. Nothing that could happen in the Breeders' Cup or the Spinster or the Bell name to change that. You don't go six for six and not win the championship, even if she flubs up the rest of the year. Yeah. But now, Monomoy Girl, who's been sitting out there in cobwebs all year long, has had three workouts, and Brad Cox has told me that she's definitely coming back, and he hasn't named a race but looking at how he's been spacing this horse's workouts when he started the workouts and the time frame he's given me, I'm pretty sure she's coming back in the spinster. That's just a guess. I didn't get that from Bad Cox, but I think she's coming back in the spinster. Now, what's the situation here? Clearly last year, Monomoy Girl was the better horse in Midnight Bisu. No question about it. Is Monomoy Girl still the better horse? And Midnight Bisu has just benefited from not having the better horse to run against this year? Or... Has Midnight Beast who gotten so good that maybe she is now better than Monomoy Girl? What's going to happen? Again, these are the fun questions that we and reasons why we like horse racing. I, I can't imagine they're going to meet up in the spinster. Uh, the, the, there's no reason to. They'll avoid one another somehow. May, maybe Midnight Beast who won't run again before the Breeders' Cup. Maybe she'll go to the Bell name or something like that. But it looks like they will, if everybody, knock on wood, stays healthy, will meet in the Breeders' Cup distaff and throw a lane in there too. And it'll be fascinating to see if the old Monomoy girl comes back and it'll be business as usual that she's just better than Midnight Bee Sue. So I, I can't wait to find out. Yeah. I'm a, I want a late in the uh, in the Breeders' Cup Classic, by the way. First, I want a late in, in Jockey Club Gold Cup. I, hope, I, hope, I do hope they give her that chance. Because uh, I think clearly she's a superior animal over 10 furlongs. But, yeah, a different note. Can you imagine Mike Smith and the luck? I mean, not, it's not called luck. The guy's a Hall of Fame rider. Yeah, I was going to say, not often no. you use the word luck with Mike Smith. Right. But going back over the years, going back a quarter century, uh, Sky Beauty, Inside Information, Azari, Songbird, Zenyatta. I mean, how many Hall of Fame mares has this guy sat on? It's just incredible. And now he's, you know, he's on another one where he put a picture perfect ride on her as well. He really did. That was a great race just also because, not just because it was close at the finish, but you could see the tactics in real time by Jose Ortiz and Mike Smith. I think they always knew where the other one was at all times. And I think Ole actually moved a little bit early because I think Jose was worried about getting caught from behind. It was a real rider's race. And it's interesting now, it's that three years in a row that Jose and Mike are ding dong to the wire in the personal ensign, just this time we didn't have an inquiry. Yeah, uh, you just brought something up that I thought was really interesting, and I never thought about it, and it's, it, it's good to think outside the box. I don't think it will happen because Bill Mott's a pretty conservative trainer. I think a Jockey Club Goka for a late is a great idea because I, I think a late strength is clearly a mile and a quarter. I mean, 
if if that race were a mile and a quarter, I think she would have won. That is her distance. A mile and eighth seems too short for her. And the Jockey Club Gold Cup, you know, sometimes doesn't come up all that strong. I hope Bill Mott does take a look at that. That would be fascinating. Yeah, I mean, you know, given that uh, McKinsey seems already ticketed for the California race for the awesome again. And, you know, I, I said it after after the person lands in that you know, she's a better stayer. She's a little more of a, of a grinder. Um, I listen. I think the ten furlongs hits her right between the eyes. If they're going to try it one time, let, you know, and they don't want to make that race the Breeders' Cup Classic, which is completely understandable, I, I would say let's do it in in the Gold Cup. Okay. Well, let's hope Mr. Mod is listening. I think it's a great idea. All right. I think we'll uh, we'll kind of move forward to this coming weekend. A lot of big races still to go in the Saratoga meet before they close up shop on Labor Day. Mainly the hopeful, I think, is a race that a lot of people are looking towards. Steve Asmussen probably has a pretty strong hand in there. He's got Godzilla pointing to their TDN Rising Star, Shoplift, another TDN Rising Star, Basin. But wanted to talk about, a little bit about the history of the hopeful, and more specifically the recent history of the hopeful, and whether or not it's a significant you know, proving ground for future star three-year-olds. They did downgrade it to a grade two event a couple years ago. Much outcry about that, I think reasonably so, because the Hall of Fame is lined with winners of the hopeful. But there is some question about how much of a factor it is in top three-year-olds preparation going forward. What do you think? Bill? Well, yeah, I agree with you on both counts. I mean, the hopeful is a good race. I, I, I think it deserves to be a grade one, partly through the history of it and what it's come to represent, you know, the, the best race at this time of the year for two-year-olds. Um, you know, it, it's... It's New York's equivalent of the, the Del Mar Futurity, which ironically seems to produce um, triple crown winners left and right. That's probably because of one white haired trainer who wins that race every single year and is also uh, has then, you know, multiple horses aiming for the triple crown. But I, I think if you're dreaming of winning the Kentucky Derby, you probably don't want to win the hopeful. As a matter of fact, it might just be the kiss of death. And it's part of the the story is part of how racing has changed. I mean, back in the 60s and 50s and whatever, um, you know, horses would come into the Kentucky Derby with 25 career starts and maybe 14 or so of them as two-year-olds. Now they're coming into the Kentucky Derby with four and five starts. And I think a lot of people are not really gearing their two-year-olds up for anything too strenuous with a possible exception of the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, which is the first race where they really want to tighten the screws. And, and the statistics tell the story. I mean, it's amazing to see that hopeful winners have just bombed when it comes to the Kentucky Derby. The last time a horse came out of the hopeful and won the Kentucky Derby was 1977. That's the year Affirmed won the hopeful and, of course, then came back the next year, 1978, to win the Kentucky Derby. Last time we've even got a horse win a triple crown race of any kind is 2004, which is a fleet Alex. That's 15 years now. So, Obviously, these are precocious horses that peak early, are not necessarily suited for a mile and a quarter. And I think if you put a future book ticket on the winner of the hopeful for next year's Kentucky Derby, I want to book that bet. Yeah, well, on the distance thing, I think is is important because there are two out of the last three years, the hopeful winner came back to win grade ones as a three-year-old, but they were at sprints, mind control, Saturday in the Allen Jerkins. And then two years ago, we had Practical Joke come back and win the Allen Jerkins as well. So I think you're right that precocity is the precocity to win the hopeful doesn't necessarily develop into classic potential. I think that's proven out, like you said, over the last couple of decades. Curiously enough, horses that have run well or won the hopeful have gone on and done reasonably well in the Breeders' Cup. Now, the Breeders' Cup is not the Kentucky Derby, but you know, the seven furlongs to a mile. Talk about stallion making races, and, and you know, there's nothing wrong with a horse becoming, a, you know, a, a good grade one winning type miler, and uh, you know, earning a, a ticket to stud, uh, you know, like a practical joke or, or something like that. Favorite trick won won the hopeful in 1997, and uh, was named horse of the year actually after winning the uh, the Breeders' Cup at Hollywood Park. So, no, and uh, not one of the better horses of the year, technically. Not anytime a two-year-old wins horse yeah. of the year. Yeah, yeah that was, um, I, you know, all due respect to, to that horse. But if you go down the list of the, 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 the 10 worst horses of the year in history, he's on that list. <laughs> yes. We're in, we are not going to get bogged down in that. Okay. I wanted to talk 
also about uh, the, just the broader scope of the Saratoga meet. Obviously, the big change this year, eight weeks, five days a week instead of six and a half at six days a week. Uh, they changed it for the construction that was going on. At, that's going on at Belmont Park, expected to continue through next summer. Bill, your thoughts about how this has affected the meet, maybe a personal experience or how you think it's affected the Saratoga handle, attendance, that kind of thing? Well, I'm ashamed to uh, admit here uh, to our listeners that I have not attended a single race in Saratoga this year. So there, Get out. Will, there will be no personal experiences. I'm, I'm sure they probably raised the price of hot dogs and beers um, uh, and, and whatnot. But I have some numbers in front of me and they tell the entire story through the weekend. Now, we're, we're taping this on Wednesday, so obviously it's not including today's races. Handle for the meat is up 6.7% and average field size is up 4.5%. Now, those numbers become much more significant when you consider that brutally hot day, which was July 20th, which was Haskell Day when they had to cancel. I estimated that they probably would have handled in the neighborhood of 21 to $23 million that day. So um, I didn't do the math, but that 6.7% in um, all, all sources handle that, that has increased looks all the, that much much better when you consider that uh, they lost that one big day. So it's worked. It's flat out worked. Those numbers tell you that. And I'm not the least bit surprised because the, look, I, I go back to the days when Saratoga were, was, you know, you never thought about anything but four weeks, 24 days. I wish we could go back to that. I realize that's completely unrealistic. But I think now the expansion it definitely has watered down the quality of racing. And there's no doubt about it. I, I mean, back in the day, you never, ever saw, you know, maiden claimers run at Saratoga or anything like that. Now, now, really, the racing there, aside from the stakes racing, is really no different than Belmont um, or Aqueduct, in, except maybe Aqueduct during the winter time. But the brand is so strong and people are flocking to it. And the thing is that they were the last racetrack in America to try to run six days a week. And very few even run five anymore. And there's not enough horses. It doesn't work. It tires out the employees. You know, everybody gets fatigued. I, I don't think it's so much the eight weeks. I think it's the five days. And they have come up with a winning formula. The five days is working. And the only way they could make the five days work was to extend the meet to the eight weeks. Naira hasn't come out yet and said what the 2020 or 2021 meet has is going to be dates wise, but they can't because they they have to have permission from the New York Gaming Association. So they can't just go out and say, hey, we're going to run from day X to day Y. Uh, that, that wouldn't be good politics because it's really in, inevitably up to the Gaming Commission, but they just rubber stamp whatever Naira wants. But you, I can guarantee you that the 2020 and 2021 meets are going to be the same format, the eight weeks, five days. And I think probably this is going to be the format from now through forever. They can't go past Labor Day. After Labor Day, it gets down to four degrees in Saratoga. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to completely extinguish the summer meet at Belmont, especially with the emergence of the Stars and Stripe Day. So I think in, in 2036, we're going to be talking about this same meet of eight weeks, five days, and kudos to Naira. It's worked. They've pulled it off. Every single metric that you can look at so far as field size, betting, et cetera, uh, has worked to their benefit, especially with improved handle. Of course, the weather has been fairly decent, which is, has um, helped very much. They've had 34 races taken off the turf this year versus 46 last year. Now, that's only uh, 12 races, but that that is fairly significant. But again, they, they made it work and get used to it. Saratoga is now an eight-week meet. Bill, you and me, 2036 road trip Saratoga. Because <laughs> that'll be the first time that I've been in Saratoga in the years as well. Also Who's driving? Oh, we can, we can, by then we can have those automatic driving cars. It won't matter. Let's Uber. Right? Yeah, well, we won't even need to do that. Well, the automatic driving cars, we can just sleep in the back. As our colleague Brian DiDonato would testify to, there was also a day that they had to cancel after yes. race four or race five. So that, you know, you know, that didn't help. I mean, it's been a tremendously wet meeting as well. And you would think statistically that would be damaging. But, um, you know, those are those are interesting numbers uh, to, to be sure. I think uh, I appreciate you bringing the numbers. But also, anecdotally, what you said about the employees being exhausted. I used to work at Saratoga, not as a writer. I used to sling sausage from the clubhouse 
uh, concession stand, and it's exhausting. Six days a week for six or seven weeks, people are beaten down. And just even beyond that, the the recreational part of it, you know, people go out after the races, and it's like spring break. I think it's like it's, if you had spring break for six or seven consecutive weeks, everybody is dead by the end of it. So I think at first, when they first made this announcement, I was like, oh, I don't like it because it's tradition. This is the only meet that runs six days. Everyone else is doing five or less. But I really think that, that having that two-day break, especially because of the festival-like atmosphere of Saratoga, really helps out. And I think you're right. I think this will stick. Joe, I think the only possibility of anything, like I, me and Al are already planning on our 2036 trip. Um, again, probably this is a subject that we should pick up on another day because it's a very complicated subject. With the declining fall crop, and can they even continue to go five days a week? Perhaps we're going to see four days a week of Saratoga racing. I don't think they can possibly go beyond eight weeks, but we'll worry about that some other time. Um, but as the full crop gets smaller and smaller and smaller, if there's not some turnaround in that. Um, that could be the one difference, maybe that they can only manage to race four days a week. Yeah, up until now, they've been kind of immune to that. But yes. you're right, the longer they stretch it out, the more they might be affected. I wanted to talk about the news of the day, which is Churchill Downs Incorporated releasing a pretty vague statement, but also a pretty seismic one about Arlington Park, which is Al's home track. And they are saying that they're not going to apply for a slots license and that they're only committing to running at Arlington Park 2020 and 2021. Al, I defer to you on this one. What does this mean for the future of Arlington? Yeah, I mean, like you said, Joe, it's um, I guess it's a little bit hard to know exactly what Churchill has in mind. You know, but according to the release, it's you know it's two more years of racing, and then who knows what. But on a personal level, having grown up ten minutes from the track and having spent countless Saturday mornings rail birding five fifteen in the morning and and making lifelong friendships and sitting across the way in in the trackside OTB and and watching from Gulfstream till the end of Santa Anita for the you know, many Saturdays as well. You know, it's an obviously bittersweet. It's not, there's nothing sweet about it, honestly. It's a very bitter pill to swallow. The notion that the marquee track in, in one of the great racing markets, um, you know, even though the racing product has declined over the years, and the, there's no denying that, but, you know, the prospect of racing on a major league level in Chicago going uh, going by the wayside is truly sad. I mean, there's, there's no two ways about it. Yeah, unfortunately, business is what business is. And, you know, even in the release, Churchill says that they have a 61% stake in a casino in, in Des Plaines, which is about 15 minutes away on the uh, on the, the northwest line on, on the metro in Chicago. So, you know, there's obviously a conflict there. I'm sure they would say it's a, it's a business decision. On some level, you understand that. But uh, as a racing fan and you know, as somebody that makes a living doing this, you know, it's very sad. Well, one thing I, first of all, I agree with you, Alan, and they're, they're not going to come out and say, and oh, by the way, after the two years, we're going to close. I mean, there's no point in doing that. But if you read between the lines, that that's the only assumption you can come up with. But I think there's one thing that could keep Arlington open at least another year or two. I don't think they will close the track as long as Dick Duchess is alive. Because even though Churchill is, you know, kind of everybody in racing uh, is whipping boy because they're so corporate, so bottom line oriented, and really become much more of a casino company than a racing company, which this goes to show because they are giving preference to keeping um, the profits up at their casino rather than trying to prop up racing in Arlington Park. Um, Dick Duchess is an icon in this business. He rebuilt that racetrack. And I also believe, and I don't hold me to this, but I also believe he's the single biggest shareholder in Churchill Down stock. Now, having said that, what is he, like 92 years old or something uh, like that? He's older than that, I believe. Yeah. So, I mean, let's hope Dick Touches well lives to be 125 and we might keep Arlington around a little bit more. But I'll ask you this question. Obviously, Hawthorne is not Arlington. It's not not aesthetically um, it's night and day difference. Arlington's a beautiful racetrack, and, and Hawthorne simply is not. It's not a very nice place. But they are now going to have a casino. Can Chicago racing survive, and how well can it do with perhaps just this one racetrack, which if you know, if, if, if the casino is successful, 
And, and I even question that because, you know, the, the proliferation of casinos in, around the country now is, is just to the point where, uh, I mean, there's there's now the casino that, that, that opened up in the Catskills is talking about going bankrupt. It has nothing to do with anything in horse racing. But, you know, they so overexpanded it, casinos in New York State. There, there's now, I don't know how you can lose money running in a casino. That seems impossible. Mm -hmm. But you've got uh, the, the ones that they've opened up recently in New York are, are financially a disaster. So we don't know how successful the casino at Hawthorne could be, but could... Chicago Racing at least stay alive and, and, and be a somewhat of a quality product with, with Hawthorne alone? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to imagine a scenario where that's a possibility. I mean, you'd have to think that a bunch of the fan base, I mean, I don't, I don't have statistics to bear this out or anything, but, you know, being located where it is in the Northwest. But nobody goes to track anymore. Uh, right. I, I nobody. Mean, Arlington, yeah. you know, Arlington can be the exception to that rule. I, okay. You know, they get, they'll get 10,000 people on, on a Sunday routinely. But, I mean, to answer your question, not to answer your question with another question, but how many Racinos were thinking about Presque Isle or were thinking about Charlestown? I mean, how many of those racetracks have thrived because, I mean, sure, purse money has gone in a positive direction, but, you know, has the product really thrived? I, I don't know. On top of that, if I lived in the vicinity of Arlington Park, I, I don't think I'm getting in the car to spend an hour to get to Stickney, Illinois, to watch a bunch of horses run around in a circle. It's a beautiful place, Stickney, Illinois. I go on vacation there at least <laughs> twice a year. Well, I, I guess we've all came to the same conclusion that this is not good news for Chicago racing. And uh, it is a shame. Again, let, let's hope that there is a different outcome to this story. But it looks like the outcome is going to be, unfortunately, two more years at Arlington. Or maybe you know, they squeeze out another year or so, and which would be very sad for horse racing. But... Uh, Unfortunately, I'm with you. I, I, I think that's that's the direction we're going here. Also, wanted to touch quickly on some other big racing outside of Saratoga and Del Mar this weekend. Kentucky Downs opens on Saturday, and there's a big card at Colonial Downs as well Saturday. Kentucky Downs, one of those tracks that does really well in terms of handle, but only can get five days a year. Uh, it's another discussion for another day. Colonial Downs has been gone for a while, came back, has been pretty successful. They got $50,000 maiden special weight races. Don't see that a lot on turf outside of New York. I think it's 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 drawn some good barns. And honestly, these two are the pla only places really where you can run for big money without Chad Brown dominating <laughs> on turf at least. And yeah, Mike Maker is usually the guy that, that runs Kentucky Downs, but always a good opportunity for horse players and People who like turf racing, big fields, and I feel like that's most of us. Bill, your thoughts? Well, first of all, I, I don't think there is any question Kentucky Downs is the single best racetrack in America and by a mile to bet horses on because you have two combinations, actually a combination of three things that every horse player wants. Number one is our huge fields. For opening day card, for 10 races, they drew 145 horses. Now, obviously, they're not going to run that many because a lot of them are on the also eligible list. Um, they have $130,000 maiden races. They have four stakes races on the card. This, I couldn't believe. Jamie Spencer is coming in to ride. Yeah. Now, one of the horses, the big horses he's named on is on, a, on the uh, also eligible list. So maybe he canceled his first class reservation on British Airways. Uh, after all, I don't know about that. But it's a fantastic meet. And there I have been in the last year or so because I just love the place. And, it, you know, I know every racetrack can't do this. But if, if you don't bet Kentucky Downs during this five-day meet, you don't like to bet because... Or you're not or you're not paying attention because this this is the single best place for the horse player, no doubt about it. I mean, I mean you can routinely you can you can hit an eight hundred dollar exacta in your sleep there, you know, because you can come up with two fifteen to one shots that you really like. So I mean, I am the world's biggest Kentucky Downs fan. Colonial Downs is kind of the uh, eastern version, or at least I think they're trying to be of of uh, Kentucky Downs. Um, they closed down for a long time uh, because, you know, there's just, there was just no place for a track out in the middle of nowhere uh, that, that, you know, with too much competition in the mid Atlantic, very nice to see him come back this year, but they are basing all their 
comeback on the exact same thing that has made Kentucky Downs flourish, these silly instant racing machines. Anybody who plays those things needs psychological help, but hey, you know, they're putting money into horse racing, so God bless them. I think Kentucky, I think Colonial Downs, which by the way, runs their last card on, on September 7th, and they ran a 15-day meet. I think they made a mistake. I think they should have absolutely copied Kentucky Downs and run five days. Now, their purses are really good, but if, if they imagine if they ran five days instead of 15, they'd be three times better than they were. Now, let's be fair. Let's give them time. This is their first meet back. They'll learn from it. Um, you know, maybe they'll make some adjustments, but there's too much race in the Mid-Atlantic area as it is. And if they had raced for only five days, just like Kentucky Downs, think of the superstar meet they would have. And... You know, I never saw, even though their handle numbers were decent and the purses were good, I never felt any of the buzz for Colonial Downs that I sense every year for Kentucky Downs. So that's just my suggestion to them. Maybe they've already thought about it. I think the less is more approach would really help them out. Yeah, the um, the Virginia Derby, which will run this weekend, um, as a grade three, I guess. Um, and just coming back, it, um, it, I'm being honest about it, it's not the greatest assembly of three old turf horses you've ever seen. It's obviously a very competitive division these days, but there's a place for a mile and a quarter turf race at this time of the year, given the cancellation or the restructuring of the secretariat. You had the mile and a quarter race or the mile and three sixteenths at, at Saratoga following the mile and a quarter Belmont Derby. You have something longer at the beginning of September, but you have some really good horses that won the Virginia Derby and I'm going to be hard pressed to come up with them right now. Of course, <laughs> uh, King's Joy won the race yeah, in, in 2000. The only one I had. 2004. <laughs> uh, War Dancer won the race. That, that's not, not neither here nor there. Was it uh, Joy and Timo? I feel like Timo might have been second in the race that. But year, you guys but. are good. I don't remember <laughs> any of these yeah, horses. I mean, I but Al, back, but back to my point. If they ran five days, mm. they probably could have made that a million and million and a half dollar mm. race. And then Chad Brown would have six horses. Mm. In that's there. right. Yeah. yeah, it's a different kind of meet than Kentucky Downs. Kentucky Downs is a real boutique kind of thing that everybody. I think a lot of people point to, and you can see that. With the Ellis Park, they have the preview day. So I think it's become more of a destination. Colonial Downs, I think, is trying to fill a little bit more of a gap where you can run some cheaper horses, but you still have big fields and bigger purses. So I, I think they're they're necessarily structured a little differently, but I'm always of the less is more attitude. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm really glad they're back because, you know, um, it's good to see any racetrack back. But it's just, you know, one, one thought. If, look, you've got a model out there for something that has been one of the most fantastic developments in horse racing in the last 20 years, this meet that is literally out in the middle of nowhere in Kentucky, right over the Nashville border. And it, it, it's a meet that has gone from, you know, started off as a steeplechase meet uh, 25 or 30 years ago to now is, is a meet that is one of the most talked about and most important meets in horse racing and the most unique meet in horse racing. I just think Colonial Downs ought to just copy them. Yeah. Only complaint with Kentucky Downs is that it should still be called the Dueling Grounds. Dueling Grounds. It's yeah. such a better name. The I, Kentucky I, I, Downs. I have no problem. Yeah, yeah, you might be right about here's, that. Here's but maybe it's not politically correct, you know, perhaps. like and, yeah. you know, and all the gun violence and the gun, gun violence yeah. and everything. Remember when the Washington Wizards were the Washington oh, yeah. Bullets. That's so, true. I didn't think you know. of that part. Yeah. Here's a little trivia for you. Which Breeders' Cup winner actually won a race at the Dueling Grounds? Probably, it's probably some jumper or something, no, right? No, no, no. Well, a tourist. Oh, oh, oh but no, at, at the dueling grounds, dueling not, not what it was still called. You want to still be politically incorrect. Um, I don't have the faintest idea. One Dreamer won the 1993 Rachel Jackson Stakes. And then uh, won Off the, the top of his head, too. No, 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 Either that or you really need to get a life. <laughs> well, listen, not I sure. mean, that's not under, that's not under debate, true. really. The TDN Writers Room, I want to thank Bill Finley. And Alan Carrasso for joining me. This is Joe Bianca, Associate Editor at the TDN. We'll see you next week.